This is Scott Richman. And Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, good morning. Good morning, warrior. <laughs> Dobre utra. You know what that means? It means good morning in Russian to get prepared for our show today. Okay. Did you have a good 4th of July, by the way? I did. I did. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to. He called me a warrior because I uh, I had an athletic injury this past <laughs> this past weekend that I'm recovering from. Uh, who knew that when you go to uh, the falls, you're really supposed to fall? But I figured that out and you took it literally. Took yeah. it literally, and uh, but I'm up and about and, and and doing much better. For our concerned audience, he looks fine. He's just a little sore. A little sore. So, um, what'd you do for the fourth? I went up to Flathead for July right. that weekend, and then we uh, went to a party. Um, the good folks from Killing Frost uh, Farms right. actually threw a 4th of July party and went there over on um, on Scott Street. Nice. And we had a nice time. How nice. about you? Uh, you know, we're doing good, I guess, in from out of town, so that was great. And today we're going to talk about Russia. I th- you know, very a timely. Topic, a very timely. You know, with the G20 going on, and ever since the election... The inordinate focus on whether or not Russia interfered with the election, or if they did, how they interfered, and for what reason did they interfere, and who isn't, you know, who coll- colluded in all that interference? Was there That's, collusion? Yeah, was there coll- all that stuff is you know continues to bubble up on, on a daily basis, and the president, as you know, doesn't add much clarity to it because some days he said, you know, there was interference, there is an interference. I know Putin. I don't know Putin. You know, it's part of that whole shell game and and set of shenanigans that go on in uh, in D.C. But Diversion. We, yeah. But we thought that maybe this week would be a good time to kind of address that. We have a, a guest from our past, one of our early shows, Dr. Vadim Levitin, who is a, who is a medical professional by training, a doctor by training, internal med- medicine training, who uh, left Russia in 78 and came to the United States and no longer a practicing physician, but a keen observer on the Russian scene, obviously, since he was born there, he's right. in the Russian military, went to medical school there. You know, obviously, he's a U.S. citizen now and lived here for a long time, but does provide that unique dual perspective on uh, on Russia and its relationship to the United States, and adds a flavor to it that's unique because of his own, you know, personal journey and personal history. And let's get his. So we're going to talk about that. And as you know, I've always been interested in in Russia. My my two grandfathers were both Russian, you know, and they were Russian immigrants who came to the United States. I started traveling there. I went there my first trip in uh, 1983, which is very early on for an American that wasn't associated with the embassy to be. Uh, and you've shared Ru- that with our Right, our and, and so I've spent a lot of time there over the years. I had an office in Moscow for almost 10 years and, and did a lot of work over there and uh, obviously pay attention to the, the you know, relationship between the U.S. and and the former Soviet Union and and now Russia, and it's uh, you know eighteen years under Vladimir Putin. Would you ever have thought that Russia would be so paramount and primary in the news a year ago, a year and a half ago? Well, you know, it it is it is considered. You know, it is still considered, and you know, we'll talk to Vadim about it. You know, one of the two when they talk about the superpowers, you right? Know, the U.S. You know, and, and China, though. well, you know, no, I, I think China plays right. a much more significant role. And, of course, there are upstarts like North Korea now, you know, you know, who launched their first true, apparently, ICBM missile, which has capability of, uh, you know, reaching uh, you know, at least Alaska or Hawaii mm-hmm. or that part of the United States. So they've, they've uh, stuck their nose into the uh, nuclear gambit. But, um, no, um, you know. I wouldn't have. No. That wasn't part of the conversation, you know. And it's ago. you know, and it's funny because we have Americans who hated Russia until Trump became president. And they kind of like you know, some right. Americans like Putin and the Russian way of doing things for some reason, which again we'll talk with with Doctor Levitin about. You know, I never particularly found it, you know, anything other than thuggery myself. But uh, right. you know, for some reason, thuggery seems to have gotten a resurgence, and uh, a lot of folks are paying attention and. Uh, um, looking at what's going on, we have this you know strange relationship. We kind of like them, we we kind of criticize them. You know, the president uh, you know was complimentary 
during the election campaign to Trump, but you know, how can you be compl- that complimentary when you're in, entangled in Syria the way we're right. entangled? Right. And, you know, on and on and on. I mean, there's lots and lots of issues that are that that ferment as a result of this. But it is the 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 relationship that stands out the most in in terms of global public affairs and foreign relations. Right. You know, between, you know, even more than China. As much as as much, you know, we see China as a trading partner, you know, maybe, and maybe a little political beyond that as they, as they exert their influence in Asia. But we're much more Eurocentric in the United States in many ways. Right. And, and the Russian relationship and its effect on Eastern Europe and the rest of Europe plays, I think, a more significant role in our thinking and our general uh, demeanor as a country than probably any other country in, in the world. So uh, that's why it keeps How coming, do you feel about all these forth. comparisons to you know, Khrushchev and Kennedy versus, you know, Trump and Putin? Like, who's out? Who's going to outclass who? Well, I don't know if it's going to outclass Or outmaneuver. Out <laughs> out, well, outclass. I can't even. I, I can't, can't even. There's not even a winner there. I can't even compare. <laughs> I can't even think about that comparison. How about outmaneuver? You know, I will bury you. Remember, Judge? Khrushchev banging his shoe on the uh, right. table at the United Nations. You know, Kennedy was a class act, you know, the, the, all, all, the whole way along. But it'll be interesting to see. I mean, look, we do tape this show prior to Sunday, so when Sunday comes, we'll figure out how the weekend went. Won't right, we? well, certainly we'll know. So anyway, Good. we'll be back with Dr. Vadim Levitin here on What Do You Know, proudly supported by Don Maddox, Glacier Sotheby's International Realty, back after these words. Arnie, we are back. Vadim Levitin, привет, как дела? Добрый день. Очень рад быть здесь. It's great to have you on the show today. I want the first thing I want to do is because we're we're sort of on a little bit of a roll here. The media, as Scott pointed out, is kind of drumming up, looking for any kind of comparisons out there, and they've they've now propped up this image of Khrushchev, Kennedy, Trump, Putin. What's your visceral reaction to hearing something like that? How you compare those? two sets of, of world leaders? Well, I'll start kind of at the lower level of comparison. Um, having Nikita Khrushchev as a leader and the subsequent leaders in the Soviet Union was somewhat embarrassing for most of the people who have any kind of semblance of conscious. Um, and why was that? What was, what was it about Khrushchev that, that embarrassed folks? Well, uh, probably the most educated, eloquent word would be stupidity. Um, right. Because... Um, <laughs> Most of the people in the country listened to them on a daily basis, and uh, they sounded really dumb. Right. Uh, my grandfather, who was a deputy minister of agriculture, couldn't listen to Khrushchev because Khrushchev had ideas about agriculture. And most of the ideas came from the United States because he came here with a few visits, and he liked so much American agriculture. He said, we can do that in the Soviet Union. So he decided to plant corn everywhere, and uh, he did, which effectively didn't really work at all. <laughs> no, <that's> right. <laughs> Considering the climate difference is small, well, there, there are a few a small <laughs> miscalculation. Russian corn. So no yeah. cornbread. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like Tata watching salad. Idiocracy. <laughs> they plant everything and, and water with Gatorade and don't understand why nothing grows. Why isn't uh, it growing? Yes. Well, I, I grew up during the Brezhnev era, um, and that was kind of embarrassing as well. Uh, he probably knew about a thousand words, um, and he didn't pronounce them well. Uh, and, and well, he was, wasn't a learned, educated man. Well, no, but, I mean, they had college education, theoretically speaking. Right. But, uh, not really. So, so the, the parallel today, let, let, let's keep Trump out of this for a moment because there's a widely, you know, disparate views on him. H- how does Putin fit in with Brezhnev and uh, Khrushchev and... You know, even later on, some of the, you know, Chernyenko and Dropoff and, uh, you know, Gorbachev even. Yeah, I think that I go back to the old uh, Brezhnev time jokes. And right. the Brezhnev time joke was in school, they're asking children, they said, you know, they're asking a little girl, said, who's your, who are your parents? And he said, my mother is my mother, Russia, and my father is uh, Comrade Brezhnev. And the teacher says, "Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be when you grow up?" And she says, "An orphan." <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that uh, it is very different from the way most of the Russians feel about uh, their president now. He's right. definitely 
not stupid. Right. Um, right. I think no one would claim that. Uh, right. He's definitely not going to do a hysterical UN speech with the shoes. No. And um, he's very controlled, calculating, pragmatic, and realistic. Right. Well, at one point, I would describe I, I would describe Russia as being run by you know the. Uh, 21st century of the KGB, and he's chairman of the board. Would that be sort of a fair general kind of statement, you think? Yeah, probably what, what the KGB uh, morphed, of right. course, and moved into a, kind of a, um, I guess, ruling class mm-hmm. right. of, of, of the country. And uh, he was not really a prominent KGB officer. He was kind no. of a junior KGB officer. Um, but it, it just, how... Uh, it evolved after the Soviet Union break, you know, broke up in 1991. Some How did he just, amass all that power? How did he? Well, um, that's there are some different theories yeah, on there, how there's he lots of different money. Theories. Some people consider him the second or third richest man in the world now, even though his salary is what a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah, I think having your own country is a good business. Yes, <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. It beats Sounds having your own com- company. Um, well, uh, during those days, the Yeltsin, who was trying to right. retire without going to jail, uh, pick, kind of handpicked him. And uh, he was benign and cool. He didn't really drink, which is very unusual, especially for Yeltsin, who did mm-hmm. drink a lot. Who drank. Um, and so I think that part of it is that. The second part is probably uh, understanding how... Um, the good word would be corruption, I guess, but it's really not in the context of Russian society. It's not really corruption, right. per se. It's, it's, it's more a way of life. Mm. And so Putin keenly understands that, and he understood it from the beginning, I suspect. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we tell our listeners how you immigrated, how you got from being a Russian military officer and doctor to uh, being on this radio show today? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, I, I moved from Moscow to Shawnee, Kansas. Um, in 78? Yes, and it was actually my choice. I wanted to move into a small town in America. And, really? Uh, yes, exactly. And I did. And uh, I started working in the hospital most instantaneously, and I purchased my first business, which was called Cotton Eye Joe's. It was a country western bar and a club and a restaurant. And, uh, and when he came to America, he didn't speak English. Really? I still As don't. a physician. <laughs> <laughs> no. As a, so you didn't practice here because you had to get licensed, or did you? Well, the first thing you do, you just get any job. So I went to the right. first hospital that I could find in Kansas City area and got hired because I could pretty much, I had skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so basically once you have the first job, you can afford What was your first go- job at the hospital? I was a respiratory therapist. Got it. Okay, which was kind of an easy job. For right, physician. but he went. To the, he went to the. But he went to the best medical school in in, oh, the, sure. in the former Soviet Union and was an internal medicine specialist, <laughs> as a physician. So, right, I moved on and uh, moved to many places since then. And I have a. I, I like and prefer technology, and what I I have a computer science degree as well. And so, basically, I do mostly technology and technology. In, involved businesses um i did work for the united nations for about seven years oh, so, okay but that's just because sometimes you have illusions of changing the world single-handedly <laughs> I, I had one of those what did you do for them i ran a project in a, one of the few muslim european countries albania oh it was a national level project and i claimed to change the history of Albania. <laughs> well, maybe overnight. <laughs> right. Well, it took seven years. But, Some of uh, my favorite Italian restaurants in New York are owned by Albanians. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and they, they, actually, I like the country a lot. Albania was uh-huh. uh, um, familiar in a, a very strange metaphysical way because it's post-communist, but it had an even more belligerent form of communism than Soviet Union. And, uh, and that was kind of, you know, close enough for me to understand, yet foreign enough for me to... Sure come up with what kind of solutions I would provide them with. So you left the Soviet Union at the time, 1978, and then you had a chance to go back, and most recently, just a few years ago, you were back to Russia. How would you describe, for, you know, for our listeners, the difference between you know, 1970s Moscow and you know, 2010 Moscow? 
Well, the differences are dramatic, of course. Um, uh, if you if you're a native speaker of the language, the first thing that strikes you is that no one really speaks the way you do, mm. um, because my language is 35 years old, and theirs mm-hmm. moved on. So to me, they all sound, um, I don't know, kind of slangish and more with the criminal influences of the language. I would sort of like sort of like. American English influenced by hip hop and rap and all of that. Is that right? Is that like right. an urban, like if you go to New York and talk to people in New York City, right? Who are just you know typical New Yorkers, they might sound different now than they did thirty five years sure. ago, right. right? Yep, right. So when they listen to me, they they're mesmerized and they say, "You sound like Tolstoy," because that just no one talks like that any longer. Um, That's great. And they always ask me like, "Where are you from?" I said, "I'm from Moscow." They go like, "No, no, no, really." Where are you from? I say, okay, I'm from Shawnee, Kansas. They go like, okay. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, it is funny how things change. Like that one girl who's very popular on the media who came up at that expression, cash me outside. Uh-huh. You know, that? And, and who knows what you know where that came from, right? <laughs> but now it's a part of. I mean, if you were, if you came back after being away for 35 years and heard people saying that, you say, what? What, happened what does that to, mean? What, what happened to the language? Right. You know, so I, I think. But how that's, great is it that you owned a Cotton Eye Joe's when you got to the United States? Yeah. Country Western boy, country that right. right. Oh, absolutely. I, I, How did that happen? Most of the American rodeo professionals would frequent my place, and they loved it, and I liked them a lot. I used to go to all of the American rodeo shows, and uh, I was a big fan of <laughs> cowboy culture huh. in Shawnee, Kansas. Um, th- those days were fun. Um, so going back to uh, the difference between Russia of my days and Russia now, and Russia now uh, it is profoundly anti-Western. Now, anti-American now, much more than it was actually. Uh, right, and I've heard that from a number of people. Yeah. It's not just coming from the. You go back there, there really is a visceral anti-American. Why? Feeling because they have everything that we have now. No, mm-hmm. I don't think. Well, there are kind of many issues. I would say some of the issues are psychological. Um, the it, uh, and some of it ge- geopolitical. Uh, I'm not sure that average person on the street, similar to our country here kind of recognizes what geopolitical situation is. Right. Um, and probably Russians, on the average, don't either. But they certainly feel like their pride has been hurt, and they've been relegated to the third-level kind of country, and they don't really think of themselves as a third-level. They have a, what we call here American exceptionalism. Right. They invented the Russian exceptionalism in the 19th century. Sure. It's, it's an old, old idea. And they actually believe that historically. Most Russians believe that they're unique in so many different ways, uh, culturally, language-wise, tradition. It's hundreds the list, and hundreds, hundreds of, of years, years of, of uh, making right. a difference, uh, protecting the world from various forms of evil. And uh, yes, yeah, I mean World War Two. I mean, twenty million lost their lives. Yeah, that's a recent you, example. Right. You know, defending yeah, against the, Germany. Yeah, let's do a quick ID. You're listening to What Do You Know? Our guest is Dr. Vadim Levitin. Yeah, so, so yeah, so there's this, we have a strong core here. We just went through it this past weekend. I mean, how many American flags were hanging all over town? We are America. Right. You know, love it or leave it. We're the tough, you know, we're, there's a sense of American exceptionalism in a country that's a few hundred years old. Right. You know, again, ninth century, you know, there was Russian exceptionalism, which right. was, Legitimate. They had a culture at that time that probably outside of China, probably would two of the stronger cultures in the world at that point in history. And so, you know, U.S. sort of, I, from my perspective, you know, pushed their nose, rightfully or wrongfully, pushed their nose in it for a number of years. And for a while, as you recall, there was only one superpower. Right. Russia was knocked out of that role when the, right. when the after 91, when the country broke into 13 right. different countries. And it was just the U.S. is a superpower. And Putin obviously fee- feeds strongly into this, you know, a nationalistic and exceptionalistic, uh, you know, feeling right. of, of a typical, you know, Russian person on the street. Yeah, if you listen to his speeches, the, the one in Munich that he yeah. did, he talks a lot about um, not the multipolar world the right. one that we should have, as opposed to the one that's dominated by the United States of America in right. many aspects, economically, politically, right. militarily. And that's the, really his case, and uh, that, that's the case that he's been building on for at least five years. You know, and the truth of the matter is, from a geopolitical perspective, you got China, right? You got you, the U.S. can't control the global 
geopolitical world anymore singularly. Right. Sure. It's clear. Particularly if we have a leadership, which I think most people would agree right now, that doesn't have, has not figured out what its footing is. Right. You know, its foreign policy footing, its role in, you know, went to Israel and flip-flopped on, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian issue. It asked China to help him with North Korea, and it said, well, that didn't work out. I mean, we don't have any clear, you know, leadership position uh, on, on a global basis right now, or at least a policy, rightfully or wrongfully. We look good weak, don't we? Well, we're, we're certainly not a country at this moment that others would look to to say they know what they're doing. They're looking right. to Andrew, Angel, you know, An- Angela Merkel is now considered one of the leaders of He's filling the, the world. Vacuum. Yeah. Well, the sometimes pretty clear yeah. on what they want to do right. and what their position is. Sometimes I, th- I think it, has some, it's, it may have something to do with the way our electoral cycles operate. That's true, because too. Because Merkel and Putin have been in power for quite a long time. Yes. Most Americans think that politicians are diapers. You need to change them often and for the same reason. Yes. And so when you, when you change it for the same reason and the new team is coming in, uh, it affects how they articulate foreign policy, if right. any. And you have a president now who, by his own admission, is not a politician. is a political novice. He might be smart, as he says he is, but politics are very... You know, a very specialized area, particularly multi, you know, national and global politics. Yeah. You know, as he's kind of finding out, is he meeting with Poland and the head of India and UK and Russia and China and all of this and all of the intricacies of all of that? You got to have a, you have to have an experienced team. His team even is not very experienced. You got, uh, you know, his, his secretary of state is a guy who ran an oil company. Who's getting frustrated you know, by but, the day. You know, and not saying that makes him a bad person. That doesn't right. make him no, a stupid right, right. person. Doesn't make him an incompetent person. It just doesn't make him knowledgeable about the area in which he's trying to oversee. Because he had a different perspective when he was, and, and he was doing a different kind of work. Right when he was running. There's a, a reason. There's a reason you study, you know, political science and you right. know, and focus on that. There's a reason you go to medical History. school to be a doctor. Right. right? There's a re- and if you take people with no background and no experience and thrust them in there, a- in a leadership role. And in a decision-making role, and a role that has effects on lots of other people, you see the consequences. Of Why do you think Trump is going so far afield and not... I mean, he did hire some and bring in some traditional, um, like McMaster and the head of... The in defense area, he brought right. in some military people. But he didn't... But why in these other areas is it just so unorthodox? Does he just think he knows how to do it better? Or is he just so out of his element, he doesn't know right from wrong? What do you think, Vadim? I'm not even sure it's just a person. Uh, I'm not sure right. it's Donald Trump. I think that the general tendency, it's kind of a global phenomenon, I think, that uh, I've been talking about this for many years at most of the conferences that I did for the United Nations, and I kept predicting how humans will uh, interact and communicate in information-rich environments, and now they do. Um, and so what I didn't foresee is that uh, it kind of eliminated the value of an expertise. Right. Because everyone knows everything because they have access to everything. Right. And they say, hey, I know everything. I'm a journalist now. I could publish whatever that is. Or, you know, and it's everywhere. It's, it's in Russia the same way. Like the former world chess champion Kasparov said, you know, we, we're familiar with fake news. That's, we call them news in Russia. <laughs> so that's a very typical example. But many people uh, in our country, they... You'd, whatever, wherever the information comes from, um, it's just so much of it. And um, whether it's true or not, that's a different question. Whether you're an expert or not is a kind of diminished somewhat. Well, when, when we had uh, Joe Juliet Buck on the show, she made a comment that before social media, you had to do a lot of, you had to pay your dues to become a thought right. leader. Right. You know, and, and the system would weed out people who were inarticulate or, you know, not professional or didn't have any great expertise in the area. But now anybody can have, you know, a blog that millions of people follow right. and, and, you know, and, and it's changed the nature of what is, you know, I'm not even talking about fake news. What is re- responsible and well thought out and legitimate, you know, information to use to make decisions. Right. You know, and with someone you know, and if you have somebody like in Trump's case, which he's, you know, it's not picking on him particularly, but it's acknowledging his own 
his own way. He has chosen certain kind of media outlets as the ones to focus on. Right. And where uh, his source, his information. And his comes. sources, you know, and, you know, he claims his stuff is real news and everything else. I mean, he said the National Enquirer is a publication that be, should be treated as a serious literary publication. I mean, that's not what most people think about the National Enquirer. Right. It's something you pick up in the grocery store when you got five minutes, you know, waiting in line to see what kind of ridiculous things somebody could say about, you know, the Kardashians. All of a sudden, it's become a And you can't source. put the genie back in the bottle. No, no. So what's going to happen? Well, I think also it's exacer- exacerbated by the fact that um, if you... You spend some time in Europe. The countries are smaller and more. They were more familiar with each other. Right. Actually, even you know, many Europeans are more familiar with Russia. They have kind of a common history. Sometimes uh, we're somewhat isolated. For by definition, we just wanted to be isolated. But what's what's the good old joke about the the United Nations asking a question? Give us an answer. How to fight the food shortage in the rest of the world? And uh, that was a complete failure because uh, many countries didn't know what food is. Right. Some countries, like Russia, didn't know what honest means. <laughs> Some countries uh, in the Middle East didn't know what solution means. <laughs> and the United States didn't know what the rest of the world means. Right. And so, I mean, it's, it is a joke. A but significant <laughs> member, number, percentage of the United States Congress have no passports, never had a passport, never traveled outside the United States. It's frightening. You know, and they see the world from a very, very Insular. limited perspective. Yeah, and we're dealing with um, still the largest country in the world with 11 time zones and 150 million people. Um, second religion in Russia is Muslim, and they're not Muslims who immigrated from any country. They were born in Russia for centuries and centuries. Um, I mean, in other words, we, we really don't have enough expertise, I believe, to deal with right. complexity of that particular country. It's very complex, it, it's just like China is, but since we're talking about Russia today, it requires expertise, and it requires experts, and it requires linguists, and it requires political scientists and philosophers. Um, it's not a negotiation where there's a winner and a loser right. every time. Well, there's not a common table. There's yeah. not, there's not, yeah. You're not sitting across from one person. It's 30 people. So question, so why is Putin so, why does he, like, why is Syria, for instance, why is that an issue? Why is that? Why is he behind Syria? Why is he supportive of Syria? Like to what? Just to screw with the United States? Well, I mean, in, or is it the oil? I think that's a good description. Screw with the United States, right? But behind it, there's actually a, a, a profound geopolitical agenda that has been pursued for years and years. Actually, that geopolitical agenda hasn't changed dramatically from the Soviet days. Um, they do think the reason things for a reason, just like we do things for a reason. Right, sure. Uh, there's a reason behind all of that. It's not random. It's not chaos. They're not unreasonable. Khrushchev was unreasonable. These people are rational. I think he's a very rational human being, and he's pursuing whatever he thinks Russia's geopolitical agenda benefits from. That includes such actions in Syria, North Korea, with Iran, making friends with other countries that we don't make friends with, um, having kind of anti-American, anti-United Kingdom stance, um, it it contributes to what he believes is an interest of the country. Is he trying to become number one again? Is that the idea? Is that the ultimate goal? Well, I, I'm not really sure. He hasn't really called me lately, <laughs> but uh, I would suspect that uh, if if you kind of listen to what he's been saying, that's not realistic, and I think. Every time I've listened to him, he's, he's talking about the multipolar world. He just doesn't like the world dominated by the United by States. One. And he, it used to be kind of a bilateral world, Soviet Union, United States. But now I, I, I'm not sure um, uh, that they really that kind of belligerent. Uh, I think they understand that actually having wars is not possible any longer. I mean, you can't have a war with Russia. That's, right. not, that's not an option. <laughs> You can't hardly have a war with North Korea. That right. may not be an option. But certainly, so that's not a solution. And, and uh, then it's a kind of a gradual thing, and, and the reference to time is very different from Russian culture. It's not quite Chinese, but they do prefer operating in longer kind of term. 
Mm-hmm. They don't. They don't see things in static. And right. And I mean, he's been there eighteen years now and running exactly. the place. Mm. It's a long time, and he has the same agenda as he had eighteen years ago. Right. Let's do so a it's quick a constant. Thing. It's a constant, uh, you know, movement in the direction that they've, uh, you know, laid out for themselves. Very, very little deviation. I mean, it hasn't switched much in eighteen years. Huh. Let's do a quick ID. You're listening to what do you know? Our guest is Dr. Vadim Levitin. And we are proudly supported and sponsored by Don Maddox Glacier Sotheby's International Realty. Arnie. So what's the light in Moscow now? I know, I know it's not, in some places in, the, in Russia, it hasn't changed very much. If you go 500 miles or 600 miles from Russia, and if you go to uh, Ekaterinburg or a place like that. But what's life in Moscow now like on a daily basis? Well, um, as... One taxi driver in New York told me once, uh, any city is good for you if you're doing well. <laughs> so for people who live in Moscow and doing well, um, it's a nice, beautiful, cosmopolitan, very advanced city. Right. With a variety of different foods to try and entertainment, theaters, arts, you name it. It's a, one of the major world cities. cities. And, it's, um, and it's, exp- it's one of the most expensive cities exactly. in the world as well. Right. The infrastructure works. Uh, things work. Um, there, there are lots of things that do work. You know, for example, fifty-four percent of Russians are college educated, which is the highest in of the world, actually. So you have more college educated people in Russia. Whether it's good or bad is another question, but they do have that. Uh, right. Education is still free. Healthcare is still free. It's still semi-socialistic society. Right. So for some people, it works rather well. For many, many people, as we saw in hundreds and thousands of people demonstrating, right. it's not that great. Right. And it's not just economics. Uh, I'm not sure just most of these people demonstrate because of they, they don't have enough means to survive on. I think they demonstrate because they object to what we object. Certain anti-Western, anti-liberal, kind of a new way of running society uh, that is very closed and very... Uh, probably semi-totalitarian, sure. somewhat, yeah. and and it kind of reminds them, uh, especially the older people, of what they lived through when they were very young. Yeah, uh, young people have no concept of what Stalin was, and they didn't really live then, and they don't remember any of it. But many people in Russia do. Well, they also see how the opposition is handled. This is the way right. Stalin handled the opposition. What are there fourteen uh, visible leaders that have been killed? You know, in the last few years? Yeah. You well, know. in Stalin's times, 14,000 would have been. Right, killed. I know. Uh, but it, but and then their families would have been it's enough of a. <laughs> it's enough of a, you know, a reminder, right? Even 14. Well, definitely. Um, I mean, can you imagine that, Scott, here? Somebody would speak up from the Democratic Party now, some leader, and two days later they'd be shot. Dead. Right. And, you would, no, and, and, and then the president would say, we're going to fire. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Their face And would they fall never off. do. <laughs> right? You know, and it happens over and over again. Sure. You know, and so that's why people are out in the street to some extent, for sure. Interesting. Well, they certainly have more control over all media channels, uh, well, most the, of them. Yeah. And, and really nothing is happening uh, in favor of opposition without sanction from, from above. So in, in your opinion, because no, who knows what the facts are, why, I understand why, Putin and the government would manipulate our election and want to put someone like Trump in power. But what is his ultimate, I mean, is he just looking at, if I can create so much dis- discord in the United States? It's to my advantage. It's to his advantage? Is that, is that how he sees it? Do you think that's kind of his strategy? Right. Is discord? Well, I go by what he says. <laughs> so what does he say? He says uh, that uh, the last huge... Uh, protests, waves of protests they had. He blamed Hil- Hillary Clinton for that. And, and he openly talked about this more than once, and he says that the United States interfered. She was the Secretary of State during the, the, those days and uh, interfered with his Russia's political process. So, And uh, in fact, they've been interfering with political process, according to him, in many countries since Chile to India to you name it. Sure. Which, and they, are, yeah. which is true. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not. We have. Well, I mean, it's part of our foreign policy. I'm just, you know, yeah. into to support one to support our position and right. our t- things in the, in other countries that would be beneficial to us. So, but do we manipulate 
the way he manipulated? Why well, not? What well, we did or we did? We according do we to don't. him, according, according to him, him, we did and we do. Right. So to him, he's, that's a fair game. That's what you do. That's what I do. In fact, we're better at it. Um, it's been happening throughout the history of humankind. Countries sure. interfered with each, with each other's all in, in, in our workings forever. Um, it is not common that you find a constituency within the country that is sympathetic to that interference. Right. Uh, so that's the difference. That that's probably the difference. So, uh, and and I don't think he's finding a sympathetic audience either. <laughs> but uh, I I think that um, from the perspective of his government, a probably a less open society, if you use Popper's description, is beneficial to Russia. Sure. In kind of a philosophical way. Right. Uh, and and so when. They listen to candidates like Donald Trump. They say, well, this is kind of more inner looking. It's making America great again, not controlling the world as they think we are trying to do. Right. Um, I don't think we are, but that's what they think. In your opinion, that's what he thinks. Well, what do you think about Trump? Meaning you've seen him from the side now. You've seen him. You live here. You're, you're an American citizen, right? Yes. So what do you think? Like, what do you, what's your perspective on what Trump is, how he's embraced this disruption and this meddling because he has i mean he's gone out and said it you know if you're going to again to your point if you listen to what his words are he hasn't done much to say you know stop leave us alone stop meddling in our elections yeah um i think um since many people voted you know my my fellow americans voted for for this candidate then uh, i would say that i'm not sure yet he, uh, at the moment, he appears unprepared, as most of the new right. upcoming politician would be walking into the White House. They would probably feel unprepared. Uh, whether he's more unprepared than the previous presidents, that I'm not sure. Um, probably, I would prefer to have uh, more expertise within the State Department to begin with. I, I did projects for the State Department, and they certainly have capacity to develop expertise um, I would prefer that in the State Department. I would prefer that in uh, all kind of different federal government levels. Uh, uh, professionals. Well, he's installed people that are that are patsies. He's installed people. Well, that the other the other thing is, you know, are not experts in, in the bigger picture of things. It's it's hard for people here to get a geopolitical perspective if they haven't spent a lot of time working around the world. We may, for example, and I'm not I'm not taking sides. I'm just pointing out facts. We're Concerned, and, and people in the United States would say, well, he's messing around in the Ukraine. He's messing around in Syria. He should, Russia shouldn't be doing that, right? And if I'm Putin, I say, well, the U.S. has military operations in 150 countries. Right. You know, why am I limited to two? Why are you concerned about me being in two? You're in 150 countries with, with your soldiers, your military operations. And folks here, I don't think, appreciate that how that resonates and the implications of that and, right. you know whether it's recruiting you know s- you know s- soldiers for ISIS whether it's uh, or, forming resistance to uh, you know t- to US policy positions in other places you know our form of democracy and our form of global you know entrenchment isn't always viewed as a positive thing for other countries right but his ideology and his the practices are completely, they're completely closed and totalitarian versus open. Even though we that's, might think we're that's what we system. think, right? right? But but is it, but but so right. why is that a better well, telling people what to do versus letting people figure out what to do? Well, the question is, do we really let them figure out what to do? And you know, there's an argument. We that say we, we do. We we do say, and and if you would listen to Putin, he says he does that too. And I'm not defending him. Believe me, I am not a we Putin sympathizer. I'm not a Putin from, sympathizer at all. You know, the consul. No, but but it, it is a complicated you know no, issue. Sure, sure. And and I think Vadim spoke very directly to the issue of we were perceived as mucking around in their domestic affairs, uh, and Hillary Clinton in particular. And so he felt he you know had the right, the the moral authority to tag her back by doing what he did. 
for allowing it to happen. Right. Now, the question is, that's, that's one sphere of influence. If there's co- collusion, right. you know, if in the American political system, it's one thing if an independent outside entity is trying to muck around and you're going to focus on them. But if they were in collusion with one political party, that makes a big difference. And that's what I think the investigations that are going on here are trying to figure out whether or not this was a, you know, this was a joint effort and not just an independent, you know, we're going to, we're going to throw some disinformation out there. I mean, the United States has been involved for a long, long time through us information agency and others in disinformation campaigns all around. Right. Disinformation. I understand that. But what if that's not collusion, but they found that, uh, Trump and his minions were being kind of blackmailed and bent over a barrel to, and is that collusion? That's not collusion. No, that's, but that's also cooperation of some sort. If you're blackmailed into cooperating, you're still cooperating. Right. right. What do you think? Well, well there are two different things. Right. I mean, one right. thing is that we, we are a legal society. We have laws and we have customs. And uh, if someone broke the law, then sooner or later they should and probably will be punished. Right. Um, but if you go to um, kind of overimpose our thinking um, onto a society that is foreign to us, like Russia, mm. uh, that's not, it doesn't feel the same to them. They don't necessarily think it's aggression and conquering territories and accept, right. you know, annexing Crimea or going to Ukraine. It's the same, well, probably the parallel would be um, if our country breaks up tomorrow and... Um, the 50 Montana is a different country. Suddenly, you have your own president, you have your own parliament, and you say we don't want have anything to do with the rest of the country. We're independent, but your family still lives there. You may right. live in Utah, but your family still lives in you in Montana. Right. You still have connections. So, uh, Ukraine is where Russia started. Right. That's the 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 Russia as a country got consolidated starting in Kiev and became kind of an empire right. gradually. So they don't necessarily see it as a foreign country. In fact, they don't call it a foreign country. They invented a term. It's called near abroad. It's not abroad. It's mm-hmm. not foreign. It's kind right. of like near. almost like if foreign. If there was an election, <laughs> well, I, I, in Russia, to to bring, to reunite the Soviet Union, it would, uh, if there was a referendum to do that, it would pass? Uh, if you ask most of the Russians, yes. Yes. The problem is, if you ask most of the Baltic republics, then no, oh, right. including probably the Russians who live there. Right. There's about 40% Russian population in Latvia. Right. They probably would rather stay in Latvia. Yeah. Who are going to, you know, they'd rather be in the European Union and NATO. Right. Right. Would you Ukrainians vote to be back with Russia? Well, they, they haven't. Right. And they won't. And they really, I mean, there were many kind of attempts by right. Putin to reconsolidate the country right. back. And unite them. That that, that yeah, was we've talked about that. I mean, Putin thinks resistance. the biggest mistake was the disintegration of the former Soviet Union. Yeah, he, he does, have, right? Yeah. yeah, and uh, he has a point from his perspective. <laughs> yes, you know, I was there when it was happening, and what didn't happen it was messy, as most of those kinds of transitions are, and there were lots of there were few winners and lots of losers in that transition from one centrally controlled region with you know. 15 republics under one administration to 15 sure. separate countries and overnight, literally overnight, one day you're your own country. Maybe like tomorrow, you wake up and Montana is a separate country all yeah. of a sudden. It is a separate country. And you needed a visa. <laughs> and you needed a visa to go to Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. Let's take a quick break. Sure. When we come back, we're going to finish our final segment with Dr. Vadim Levitin. Let's ask, let's, let's get down and dirty. Let's get some predictions on what we think going to happen at the G20 because it'll already have happened. All right. Okay, let's see where, where we end up. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO back after this. We are back. So, Vadim, I'd like you to address this this fact for a minute for, for our listeners. You know, the United States is 50 states. There's a lot of diversity in this country. People have come from lots of different uh, cultural backgrounds, you know, and, and we have a melting pot. And even regionally in the United States, people in Mississippi are different than people in California in terms of their their attitudes and some of their cultural interests. They're, they're different than folks in New York. But in in the former Soviet Union or in Russia today, there are hundreds of minority groups 
that have been there for a long, long time. How does that all? How, how do they coexist, and what's the imp- what's the impact of all of that? I mean, it really is a is it's an exotic place compared to here because of that. Yeah, I think probably the, on a metaphysical level, I would say that it, it's very different from American multiculturalism. Russian multiculturalism is uh, more defined by one ethnic group, let's say, how would other ethnic groups see that group? As opposed to the United States, where we kind of think that any group can assert themselves the way they want to. Right. Um, and it's it's profound difference. And so it's all in relation to other groups. And, uh, for example, in the center of Russia, uh, there's a big republic called Tatarstan, where most of the people are not Russian at all. They're Tatars, and uh, they're Muslim, mostly, some Buddhists. And, uh, and they have a great relationship with the Russian federal government so far. They have their own president, and they have their own parliament. So right in the inside of the Russian country, there's another country. Definitely. Yeah, most people would not know that, obviously. Yes. You know. And there's several. <laughs> there's several of those, right? <laughs> yeah. There, there's a Jewish republic in Siberia. Right. What about no. Chechen Republic? Uh, that's a, another good example. It's in the center of Russia. It will never be able to get out of the <laughs> big country. It's... It's, it's kind of locked inside, uh, surrounded So is there a, a go-along, get-along kind of standoff philosophy? You guys don't mess with us too much, and we won't mess with you too much and let you do your thing? Because having a president, I mean, if Donald Trump woke up one morning and Kansas had its own president, he wouldn't, that wouldn't sit very <laughs> well with him. Putin has somebody in his country, in, inside his own country, in Tar, you know, Tartistan, that's the president of that country. Well, I my football team is Kansas City Chiefs, right. so I actually would like that scenario because yeah. <laughs> we're probably finally going to win the uh, NFL um, trophy. But the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl, <laughs> yes. But uh, um, I think that it it's just so traditional for for their society in Russia. They're used to it. They've been doing this for a few hundred years, um, and, and and so this multicultural society does exist. It does work. There's plenty of prejudice to go along. You know, but, sure. But th- they figure it out sooner or later. Um, they don't have a choice. And that's kind of my message, I would say, to most of the world. You just don't have a choice. Russia's not going anywhere. Right. Uh, and uh, just because Putin is going to retire does not mean yeah, that 60, the next one... He's 64 now. But, we'll eventually retire. Yeah. So maybe the next one will not take his clothes off and get on the horse... But mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be better. Right. We don't really know that. So I, I don't think we should be dealing with personalities as much as we right. prefer. Uh, well, it's simpler do- for people to focus in on the personality. I mean, Russia, Putin, Russia, Putin, and, you know, you don't talk about 200 you know, million people that are there in all these different cultural minorities and, and you, know, the, you know, the daily life of the country. It's all focused on one person. What's so scary is the the example of Kansas City and getting Kansas having its own president and yeah. uh, its own football team. Trump had his own football team. I was thinking about that. Yeah, New right. Jersey General. <laughs> yeah, he did. It's so scary how history actually repeats itself and is going to continue to do so. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, getting into back into personalities and right. answering to your question, uh, what's happening at the G twenty? G twenty. I think that uh, my prediction is that. The personality, the way the sure. personalities kind of mingle together, Trump will probably make a major effort to get along with President Putin and uh, vice versa. I think that President Putin would be much more inclined to, uh, on a personal level, get along with Donald Trump than with any other American politician at the moment. Right. For many reasons. Uh, right. Some of them are just personal. Uh, they're both multi-billionaires to begin with. Um, that kind of unites them together. Money hasn't been an issue for either one of them for a long time. It's not the money. They have interesting egos and uh, the kind of the way they identify themselves versus other people. Um, and I think it's in the geopolitical interest of Russia and the United States to find some kind of solution. Okay, maybe it's driven by personality somewhat for temporarily, but I suspect and I predict that they will get along just fine. And uh, hopefully they'll come. So there's up. enough oxygen in the room for both. I I hope so. Huh. Well, we'll see. We, we we'll, will see. We'll revisit this. I can. I see, I see that as a plausible scenario. However, however, what I think, I really do. I think Trump can't help himself. 
he can't help himself, and something he's going to do is going to. Yeah, but it may not be directed at Putin. It might be directed at at Merkel or somebody. It's directed at us. Yeah, right. Back at us. It's back at the intelligence agency and our former presidents. Yeah, he's criticizing his own country, which is an an unusual strategy. How does that work, though? And we still embrace him. Well, not a majority of us anymore. He's at the lowest popularity of any president in history. There's more people that want him impeached. He's more popular in Russia. There are more people that, more Americans want him impeached than are supporting him at the moment. So he's on a slippery slope with his act, with his actions. That's a good behavior. place to end this yeah. conversation. Yeah, it's been a pleasure as always Thank to have you, you on Vadim. the show. Thank you. And share your interesting uh, bicultural perspective on things. We'll, we'll be back with uh, Vadim in about six months to see how this all pans out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Scott, take care. See you next week. See you next week, Arnie. Thank you. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO, AM 1290, 1015 FM, and newstalkkgvo.com.